I'm so glad you've taken time out of your day to join us on the Clark Howard Show. You know, our mission is to serve you with advice and information that empowers you so you make better financial decisions in your life. And today, I'm going to talk about something I love so much, you becoming an entrepreneur. So there are a lot of people trying to give you a shortcut to being an entrepreneur that turns out to be a shortcut to disappointment and you losing money. I'll tell you what you need to know, what to watch out for. And later, it's officially summer travel season. And that's led to warnings about long security lines. The recent Memorial Day holiday weekend was a disaster in a lot of airports for security wait times. But there is possible help on the horizon to deal with those forever waits. I want to talk about that. So I, I didn't know you could be this, but I'm truly a born entrepreneur. It was always so much about who I am, what I'm about, that I wanted to be in business for myself. And I don't know why it's like a culture that happens in some families. Because if you look at my extended family, all the way to first cousins, it was routine that we would go into business for ourselves. It's just what we did. A, a family of, of merchants, of people who wanted to run their own thing. A lot of people don't come from an environment that it's just innate in the family culture that you go do your own business, that you start your own business. In my family, with my siblings, all four of us, all four of us have worked for ourselves much or all of our lives, running our own companies. But what if that's not your family culture? What tends to happen when you feel like you're in a rut, working for the man, could be a woman, but working for the man wherever you work, or the woman, and you're like, I want to do my own thing. A lot of times what you turn to is the enthusiastic friend or work colleague who says, I got this thing for you. I mean, it's so awesome. What you do is you sign up with me for this, and then you are going to be rich. Let me show you how the upline and the downline and the sideline works. And it's another pitch for a multi-level. And the whole idea of multi-level is one of those things, hope springs eternal, that you sign up for this thing, and it's an instant business. And you pay whatever you pay to get into it. They may require that you buy inventory. And then you're free to sell. And the person who recruited you gets commissions on what you sell. The person who recruited them gets commissions and blah, blah, blah. That's your upline and downline is the people you recruit in. And before you know it, you're just sitting back counting money. Okay, so that's the pitch. You know, best guess Somewhere more or less one out of every 100 people who get involved in a multi-level don't lose money doing it. That's right. Almost everybody who gets involved in a multi-level walks away with less money than they started with. And then a lucky few make real money. But the one that, that's always driven me crazy is, get in on the ground floor of this new marketing opportunity. This one's growing like gangbusters. You want to be in it. And you'll be pitched at church or community group or at work or the worst is when it's a close friend or family member. So people will look to me to be the bad guy. They'll say, you know, my best friend is just all into this thing and really keeps bugging me to do it. And it is almost like a religious fervor because like any sales organization, you got to get in people's heads this dare to be rich kind of thing. And so 
they may really believe it and feel it. In TV land, I've done so many stories over the years focused on multi-levels that people were getting into. And the pitches, you know, I, I get to talk to the promoter kind of people, and you'd hear them and their eyes almost looked like they were possessed, talking with all the excitement. But here's the thing I want you to think about. Anytime somebody's pitching you an Insta business opportunity in a multi-level, number one, you have to believe in the product or service they're selling. Number two, it has to be being sold at a price that's competitive in the marketplace with other sellers. Could be retailers, online sellers like Amazon or Walmart.com, whatever. It's got to be priced competitive in the marketplace. And third, and most important, the real source of money that you make should be from the sale of the product or service, not from all the crazy up, down, downline, sideline, left line, right line, all the various matrix they'll show you. Matrixes? How do you say matrix plural? Is matrix a plural word? Anyway, all this stuff that they're showing you at the presentation. And, and wait, wait, you're going to make all this money this way and this way and this way and that way. And I mean, the reality is, sadly, a lot of multi-levels are basically a game of, of chance. Because the odds that you would make the kind of money they're promoting and promising is pretty much impossible because you'd quickly run out of people on earth with all their examples of the downline and upline and blah, blah, blah line. So know this, be aware of it, be skeptical. Don't get infected with that enthusiasm from somebody else unless you meet those tests I talked about. Belief in product, belief in price, and that the money you make is from the sale of the product from all the crazy math they're showing you. Okay, we'll go to questions now. This one's from Marcy in Georgia. I know Clark believes that hybrid long-term care insurance is the least bad type of long-term care insurance, assuming the company is rated well. I've recently been made aware of a company that requires a full prepayment of $50,000 for a hybrid policy. How does Clark feel about prepayment versus annual premiums, assuming the company is rated well by AMBEST? This is a great question. And Marcy, this is why this whole long-term care thing is so difficult. So what's a hybrid policy? It's where you buy something that I don't normally recommend for most people, usually a whole life insurance policy. That's what the industry refer to as, refers to as permanent insurance. It is a life insurance policy that has a death benefit. In other words, you die and you get the stated benefit. Or you have... Um, and in it, you also have a, basically a savings account. Not the most efficient way to do either. But in this case, buying a hybrid policy is one that has a living benefit. In the event while you're living, you need long-term care, assisted living, care in the home, whatever, and you qualify medically, you can get a benefit from the policy, which is why it's called a hybrid, while you're living instead of when you die. In the event you never need long-term care, then your beneficiary, whoever you designate, or beneficiaries receive the death benefit of that policy. It is common with these hybrids that you pay the full premium up front. And that is okay to do as long as you've done exactly what you said and the insurer has an AM best rating of A double plus. Marginally, it would be okay at A plus. Any lower than that, don't do. Daniel in Iowa says, Clark, I thought you might find this information useful. Last week, my girlfriend was a victim of identity theft. Someone opened a checking account in her name, tried to withdraw several thousand dollars from different accounts, used her credit card, and tried to open a home equity loan in her name. 
After filing a report, identitytheft.gov report and a police report and talking to the local police, I was made aware that she can apply for an identity theft passport. I'm not sure if this is a state-run program or if it is nationwide. The passport is a document that an identity theft victim can show to authorities if they are arrested for debts that aren't theirs. I think this is a great tool to use and hopefully is something that is worthy of Team Clark. And P.S. We both have our credit frozen, so it could have been a lot worse if we didn't. Thanks to your suggestion I followed years ago. So, Daniel, um, I'm so glad that it was limited to what can be brutal, the checking account. And the value of the identity theft passport that is offered by various states, not all 50 states offer it, but it's something that is more common because people need a way, particularly with fake checking accounts, um, to have this document that you carry with you in states that don't have it. You want a police report showing that a checking account was opened under false circumstances because otherwise the craziest thing is victims, as we've talked about since the 1980s, mm -hmm. victims who have had a checking account opened as if they're them and then those checks end up being dishonored, have warrants sworn out for their arrest. And the police officers don't know what to do. I mean, they, they pull up, you know, they stop you for a speeding violation or whatever. There's a warrant for your arrest. And next thing you know, you're in handcuffs. So that's why states attorneys general in various states are issuing these documents that you can present to a police officer who otherwise is gonna cart you away to jail because the checking account is one of the greatest holes that exists with identity theft. So it's great to see if in your state, and you're in the state of Iowa, so you have this identity theft passport. If you're ever someone who finds out that somebody opened a checking account as if they're you, you want to see if your state offers an identity theft passport through the Attorney General's office. If they don't, you want to have that police report on your person you know, uh, at all times so you don't end up in jail and having to hire a police, uh, having to hire a lawyer to represent you. Nobody pays you that money back either. The credit card thing, did I talk recently about a person trying to use my credit card to buy uh, almost $4,000 worth of stuff at Best Buy? Um, I, I know you talked to me about it, but I'm not sure if you mentioned I it didn't on the mention, podcast. So typical credit card kind of thing. My Costco Visa card, somebody went to a BP station and bought $12 worth of gas or whatever there to see if they, the duplicate card they had, because I had my actual physical card, if they were able to make it work. And that went through with Citibank. And then when they went to Best Buy and they tried to spend 4,000 uh, bucks, the Citibank system said, no, that's not Clark's pattern and did not approve that charge. I got one of those texts that said, did you recently attempt to <laughs> buy so many thousand dollars at Best Buy? I immediately answered, I think two was no, I said no. And uh, it said that if I was trying to make that charge to say one and they'd approve it, but their pattern system was right. And I have my new card already. You know what I don't understand? Costco changed my membership number. Oh, really? Hmm. Like the crook was actually going to try to use my membership number. Well, maybe they're trying to save money and shop at Costco. <laughs> with, with a stolen <laughs> card as if they're me. <laughs> but, uh, but the credit card takeover, even with my credit frozen, is still a very common thing. But the checking account, oh, man, that's the one you want to have proof of. So that if there's ever an erroneous warrant issued for your arrest that you have something there to protect you. And all 50 states should do this, or there should be a standard 50-state form that the Attorney General's Office of each state can do. Okay, and we've got a couple of questions about this topic, and so I'm going to read Ron in Georgia's. We recently applied for an apartment, and they sent us a link to use an income verification service from a third party. This service appears to be new and risky because it requires a connection to my bank account. Does Clark have any advice on this service or other income verification services that require a bank connection? Their terms of service are one-sided as well. Hopefully this is not becoming the norm. 
but it definitely is. It is becoming <laughs> the norm. There are many different companies that apartment uh, owners, you know, a lot of the apartments are big corporate entities, and they are farming out income verification services to third parties. Uh, many of them want direct look-see into your checking account. When I recently had to go through this for my son's apartment at college, so there was no dorm space available. Your son and mine going to the same college. He gets a great dorm room. My son gets none. So we have to go find off-campus housing. And Sorry. Th- yeah. I will. So uh, in, in uh, the case of that apartment, they wanted to do a credit check only, which was historically what was done. I had to thaw my credit and let them do the credit check. But what you experienced, Ron, is much more common today that they do want to go a step beyond and they want to look inside your checking account. Anytime this kind of information is in somebody's database, it magnifies the potential for problems, identity theft, theft of funds from your account. But the apartment you want to rent can set up whatever system they want and these income verifications are very, very common, unfortunately. And if you, your alternative is you don't rent from a place that uses one of these services, but it will limit your choice in the marketplace. Coming up ahead, uh, gosh, it's roulette. I even have a clear membership, pre-check membership. I have a digital membership with one airline where I go in a special line at the airport. And the lines are like, who knows what you're going to have. And if you don't have any of that stuff, thousands of people miss planes every day because the lines at security. But the cavalry may be riding to the rescue. I want to talk about that straight ahead. It's so hard for the TSA to be able to recruit and retain enough employees and to be able to staff for peak periods like big holiday weekends, big holiday periods, um, after a big sporting event like the Super Bowl or something like that, to staff security lines the day, you know, the morning after. It, it's just a mess. And my answer all along has been, why is this not done by private industry? And it's a shame that the airport security is handled by the government instead of overseen by the government. But that's an argument for a different day. But there is something happening that gives me a glimmer of hope. And that is technology is being tested in Las Vegas where screening is done fully automated. And it just speeds the process up so much. It's crazy. And so far, fingers crossed, it does not increase risk that someone will be getting uh, contraband weapons, whatever, bomb-making material through screening. So I said to you when I briefly mentioned this months ago that I was going to figure out a reason to go to Las Vegas to try it, and I have not been able to make that happen. But it's the kind of thinking that we need happening because what we're doing right now is ridiculous. It should not be a situation where people are told, like people were told at many airports before Memorial Day a few weeks ago, that they had to arrive at the airport three hours early so they would have confidence they wouldn't miss their flight. (laughs) And the problems that Denver has had have become legendary in a bad way where people by the thousands miss flights routinely, not even during a holiday, because the lines are so out of control. And then big convention markets like Orlando, And Atlanta will have, and Vegas, will have conventions in 
And then there's this big rush of people to the airport, and they can't make their flights. And at Atlanta Airport recently, which is the world's busiest airport, the security lines stretch from departures all the way back through arrivals and then out onto the street with people waiting for security. So using automation to properly screen things and not be so labor dependent is the right answer. It's just going to be a matter of getting this right. But also, something you should know if you travel infrequently, a lot of airports have not, don't have central security. They have decentralized security areas. You can go to wherever at an airport, at most of them, the lines are the shortest. And at many of these airports, you can then reach any part of the airport and save a lot of time, even if you have to do more walking, going through whichever security area has the shortest lines, which you'll find usually on either an airport-supplied website or the TSA will tell you what the current security wait times are at different areas of the airport. That has saved me so much time and aggravation over and over again at airports, big airports across the country. All right, let's go to some questions. Dan in North Carolina says, my 16 year old will get her driver's license in a few months. <laughs> Congratulations Congrats to your 16 year old and, and regrets <laughs> to you as a parent. Seriously. Um, her mother and I are divorced and our daughter splits time in both houses. She'll have her own 2004 Subaru to drive to school, work, etc. but will probably occasionally drive my car or her mom's too. She's been a very good driver so far, but I'm nervous and confused about the money side. What's the best way to insure this new driver? Will she need to be insured on three cars with three high premiums? Can she be added to one parent's policy but insured on all the vehicles? Is it possible for her to get her to be insured on her own policy? We're wait I'm waiting with all my fingers and toes crossed for a smooth ride. Oh, poor Dan. I know. <laughs> oh, Dan, I've seen this movie. Mm -hmm. um, so this varies so much by insurer and by state. And so I don't know if you deal with you or uh, her mom deal with an individual agent or deal with an 800 number insurer. But whatever it is, these are the questions you need to ask. You need to say, okay, is it best off with the vehicle being owned by our 16-year-old and being insured on her own? Is it best for one of us to own that vehicle, usually whichever person has uh, fewer assets at risk possibly what is going to be the best way and in not in every state but in most states you're going to want to limit her driving only to the 2004 Subaru without her being an occasional driver of either your car or her mom's car uh, but this is one that there is not a standard answer for and it's clear as mud and that's why you each want to talk to your own insurer that you use. Again, with an agent, it's where you're going to get the best information. But if it's toll free and you talk to whoever the auto insurance specialist is, you've got to do that. And um, I think about how many people we've heard from who don't allow a child to get past their learner's permit because the cost of insuring is so crazy high for a 16 or 17 year old. And it's amazing how many 18 year olds don't have a permit yet because of this problem with how expensive auto insurance is. Even when a kid doesn't have a, a principal vehicle to drive like your 16 year old with the Subaru, just being a driver in the household can mean thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars in increased auto insurance premiums. And I know I'm not making you feel any better right now. That's why you both 
got to hit the phone right away and see what structurally is going to get that lowest premium for the 16-year-old. Donnie in Oregon has had a lot of heartbreak. Um, just want to let you know before I read it. Okay. When I was in high school, my sisters and I lost our parents in a car accident. And oh, man. Yeah. And now my 46-year-old sister has lost her husband to cancer. As her oh. brother, she counts on me for financial advice. I'm trying to get her to invest a large sum in S&P 500 index funds. This is money she may never need access to since she has her late husband's pension as a police officer. She recently visited her credit union where they are trying to get her to invest money at a fee of 1%. It seems like over time she will do better with the index funds, but I wanted to see what you thought. Donnie, first of all, all the tragedy that's hit you and your sister. Sisters, yeah. Sisters, he has. Sisters. Yeah. I'm so sorry. I'm glad that you both have had the strength to move on uh, losing your parents as teens and live full productive lives. Uh, let me say something. I love credit unions. I hate them for investing. Hate them. It is not a core role for a credit union. Credit unions tend to charge very high fees on investing, like bank-based investment arms, and your instinct that that's wrong, wrong, wrong is so right. And you're thinking that if this is money your sister does not need except way down the road to invest it in index funds is beyond brilliant. Um, I would recommend that uh, broad market or total market index funds or ETFs instead of the S&P because you're going to pick up mid-size and smaller companies. You'll pick up all, basically, of American capitalism. And if you follow the teachings of the Bogleheads, if you don't know who the Bogleheads are, go read up on what they are. Big Vanguard fans. Yeah. They're big believers who believe so much in the uh, late founder, deceased founder of Vanguard. Uh, there's a big belief in having a portfolio of three index funds. Read some of that. Uh, having international exposure, I think, is really valuable. And having some amount at 46, not needing to draw on the money, 10 to 20% of the money may be in bonds. But read up on doing a two or three uh, index fund or ETF portfolio. The expense ratio can be as low as zero, but really never gets above, with a low-cost provider, like three basis points, three one-hundredths of one percent. Makes no sense for a situation like your sister's to be paying 1% for advice at all. And maybe going back to the advice you gave someone recently, maybe go to Vanguard, use the digital advisor, or depending on the amount of money, because you know, you've been saying the stock mar market's overvalued and you're not a financial advisor, but there may be, maybe a financial advisor might suggest putting this money in in pieces, like not all at once right so, now? So, yeah. So, dollar cost averaging in, where you put in roughly equal amounts over typically a glide path of 18 to 24 months, deals with the psychological shock of a big stock market decline, because markets have corrections and they have bear markets. And if you put your money in all at once and it's just before the market has a big drop, uh, financially in hard dollars in the short term, and psychologically, for the long term, it can be devastating. And that's the advantage of dollar cost averaging. Over time, if you can override the psychological of that, math shows that just putting in the lump sum will make you more money over the long haul because there's so many more good years than bad. But I really like funneling into the market with dollar cost averaging because the psychological is a real aspect of how we as humans react and human nature. Okay, Jen and Donnie, I just want to say, I, your sister's so lucky to have you. That's awesome. Um, Jennifer in New Jersey says, many doctors are moving to patient portals. Yes, they are, my goodness, where you can review <laughs> test results, etc. The patient has to fill out a bunch of forms giving consent. I started filling one out recently that had me concerned. I rarely read these forms, but for some reason I decided to read this one word for word. 
I was dumbfounded since to me it sounds like the IT company is relieving themselves of liability if my information gets compromised. Am I signing my rights away if I were to agree to these terms? And then a couple of quotes. The, the third party is not liable for improper disclosure of confidential information, and the third party is not responsible for breaches of confidentiality caused by you or an independent third party. Yeah, and this is true across any of the hospital-based systems or uh, doctor's office-based systems that the technology providers and the pro medical provider or hospital themselves, they all say, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we lose control of this data. Well, eh, things happen. It's worth it for my case with having uh, had diagnosed with cancer almost 16 years ago and being in disease management for that and having, you know, a factory second heart here and all that. So for me, for disease management, it's worth it for me to take that risk that the data be shared. And for me, I don't... You know, I don't care. I talk about all my health problems. So I'm not worried anybody sees my files. A lot of people have stuff in their medical files that are very sensitive things. They're very private as individuals. And if you're not dealing with a serious or life-threatening chronic illness, maybe you don't sign up for one of these portals. But especially if your medical privacy is really, really important to you, Know that uh, as soon as data is in a database, there's always the risk it can be compromised. So in your case, Jennifer, you're really worried about what could happen with this data. Don't sign up for the patient portal because the permissions you're giving that if, ah, well, they end up over here, over there, or whatever they're saying, oh, well, let me tell you what was in Jennifer's file. If that would freak you out, don't sign up. For me, it was worth the risk. And I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Now, there's big happenings tomorrow. You know what that is? It's Friday. Not only is it kickoff to the weekend, but it's time for our latest edition of Clark Stinks. And I hope you'll join us tomorrow. And know what we're about today and every day. That you learn ways to save more, spend less, and avoid getting ripped off.